Hi, I'm Martin Sweatman, and in this video I'm going to continue my review of the Younger Dryas Impact debate research. Now, the last time we covered the published research from the original Firestone et al. paper in 2007 through to the end of 2009. So this time we'll only cover um, 2010. Uh, as you can see from the list, uh, by 2010, the debate was beginning to hot up with quite a few publications in 2010. So remember where we got to at the, at the end of 2009. The Comet Research Group had published uh, several papers that claimed to have found the geochemical signals uh, at the base of the black mat of a continent-wide cosmic collision event that triggered the Younger Dryas mini ice age around 13,000 years ago, which in turn led to the demise of many species of megafauna and major changes in human populations. But their data was contested by a core group of archaeologists, anthropologists and geologists who were not at all keen on the impact theory. And the fact that they were leading proponents of other theories for these effects probably has got a lot, of to, lot to do with their heavy criticism. Now specifically, the Comet Research Group had found evidence of, and I'll just bring up their paper, had found evidence of um, things like magnetic grains, various types of spheral, uh, rare elements like iridium, um, nanodiamonds, that's in a different paper, uh, abundant charcoal, and even more exotic materials at the base of the so-called um, black mat, which I'll just find a, a picture of for you. So there we go the base of the black mat, which stretches across most of North America and into Western Europe. And they try to tie the timing of these geochemical signals to the beginning of the Younger Dryas period, which is nearly 13,000 years ago. But their opponents were unable to reproduce their findings for magnetic grains, except at one site at Lubbock Lake, or their results for rare elements like iridium and so on at the base of this black mat. And they argued that the, the spheral evidence is too hard to define properly, so it shouldn't be used, which is a fair point. Now, although it's not clear why they couldn't reproduce these results, and I'll just go back to the results again. So although it's not clear why they couldn't produce these results, the fact that these signals couldn't be found brought the whole impact theory into question. So clearly one of these groups is either making up the data or more likely making mistakes in their analysis of the soil samples, which is certainly not easy to make. So we are kind of left in limbo. Which group should we believe? What's needed is more evidence, preferably, preferably from a third independent research group to either confirm or to refute the theory. Now, at the same time, other, researcher did quick, other researchers had questioned the impact of the Younger Dryas event, whatever it was, on human populations. They're basically suggesting that nobody really noticed it that much. Um, but as we saw, their method was flawed and the general view among experts of this period is that there was a bottleneck in human populations after the Younger Dryas event, which signaled the end of the Clovis culture, specifically in North America. Okay, so that sets the scene for this second instalment covering the research published in 2010. Before I get into that, I think it's worth just talking about what these various geochemical signals are here that are recorded in these plots. So the main indicators that we have left to consider are magnetic grains, the nanodiamonds, and rare elements like iridium. So what are they, and, and why are they good indicators of a cosmic impact event? Well, cosmic impacts are incredibly energetic because the, the impactor usually arrives at such high speeds typically around 30 kilometers per second for comets in the inner solar system. Okay, so that's extremely fast. So it only takes a few seconds for them to penetrate Earth's atmosphere, which is uh, 100 kilometers or so thick, uh, and impact the ground if they make it that far. Now, the high velocity through the air, because of friction, creates extreme temperatures high enough to vaporize most of the cometary material as well as a lot of the ground around the impact site, if they actually hit the ground. Uh, and this is what the explosion is. It's the, it's the vaporization of previously condensed matter. Now, even if the comet, and we're, we're talking about comets here, really not asteroids, 
is too small to reach the ground and instead explodes high in the atmosphere, we still get huge temperatures and pressures generated at the heart of the explosion. But just like rain condenses from water vapor in cold air, the vaporized material from the explosion, whether it originated from the comet or the impacted ground, will also quickly condense into droplets as it cools shortly after the explosion. Only in this case, the droplets will be largely formed of carbon, metal and silica, i.e. rock. So the droplets will be flung by the explosion at high velocity through the air, possibly back into space as well, for hundreds or even thousands of miles. And they will form a fine carpet of debris around the explosion site, obviously with more debris near where the explosion happened. So we can expect to find these condensed droplets or grains, because they're very tiny, of carbon, metal and silica, forming a fine layer over a very large area. Basically a wide ranging layer of exotic dust is formed. And some of that dust will form spherical droplets like raindrops and, and some will not. For example, droplets that splatter on the ground before they solidify will form all sorts of shapes. And as the metal dust is mostly formed of iron, uh, it will be magnetic. Uh, and this dust is called magnetic grains in the research literature. So it's a bit like iron filings, but even tinier. Now for a large impact with high enough energy and pressure, it might even be possible for tiny nanoscopic regions of the carbon grains, so the carbon droplets formed as they cool, to turn into diamond, uh, which are called nanodiamonds. Now, alternatively, we know that some meteorites already contain nanodiamonds, likely formed when the solar system formed. Uh, and in particular, one kind of diamond structure called a Lonsdaleite is thought to form under even more extreme conditions than ordinary nanodiamonds. Now, the, thing, the, the, the key thing to note here is that this kind of debris is not produced by volcanoes. Lonsdaleite in particular can only really be formed in some kind of cosmic explosion. So a fine carpet of this debris or dust can only really be explained by a cosmic explosion. We don't see this kind of debris formed around volcano sites. Moreover, this dust will have exotic elements in it like iridium and platinum at far, far higher concentrations than the Earth's crust because comets and asteroids have these elements at far higher concentrations. So higher than expected concentrations of exotic elements like iridium uh, or platinum mixed with this dust can only really be explained by a cosmic explosion. Put it another way, nobody's ever thought of a way that this kind of debris can be formed naturally on Earth. A lightning strike might form some kind of dust like this, but certainly not with a high concentration of exotic elements. And obviously the extent of the debris would be very limited in range. However, this kind of dust is also being formed all the time as Earth travels through space, because Earth encounters lots of tiny meteoroids. So in effect, it's always raining nanodiamonds and tiny metal rock and carbon dust, which comes from space. But the amount of this dust is tiny, so we expect to find a background amount of this dust wherever we look, but a sudden abundance or excess of this dust strongly indicates a large cosmic explosion has occurred. And by radiocarbon dating, the soil in which this dust layer is found, we can even date the explosion. And this is what the debate surrounding the Younger Dryas impact is all about. All right, now back to the story. Remember the impact theory is in trouble because the high amounts of magnetic grains and high concentrations of iridium found at the base of the Younger Dryas black map by the Comet Research Group were not reproduced by their opponents. Fortunately, we still have the nanodiamond data, which indicates the experiments that tried to reproduce this data are probably flawed in some way, although we can't be sure of that. So what happens next in 2010? Well, unfortunately, the theory took another bashing. So in this paper by uh, Dalton, Pinter and Scott, uh, they argued that the electron scattering data that had been used previously uh, by the Comet Research Group to identify the nanodiamonds couldn't be interpreted simply as, as could could be interpreted simply as stacks of graphene or perhaps tiny um, crystals of graphite. Okay, so it doesn't have to be nanodiamonds. So th this is the data that they're talking about. They suggested that these tiny graphene or graphite inclusions in the carbon droplets 
could have been made in a normal forest fire and therefore don't, doesn't have to indicate um, a cosmic event. So this is the scattering data that we're talking about. Now these patterns are generated by uh, an electron beam bouncing off the atoms in, in the samples. Uh, and because the atoms in the sample are, are regularly spaced in, in a kind of crystal lattice, the patterns have these rings and um, specific points in them at very specific distances and locations from which an expert can read what specific type of crystal is doing the scattering. Okay, so these patterns are very specific to the particular crystal which is being imaged. Now, to be honest, I'm not an expert in this kind of scattering data. So it's not obvious to me who is correct here, whether the Comma Research Group or whether Dal Dalton et al are correct in their analysis of these patterns. But the, their opponents, Dalton et al, do seem to have a point that it, 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 the telltale signature of nanodiamonds versus something like graphite or graphene looks to be quite tricky to distinguish. So we really need to rely on the experts getting it right here. So Dalton question this evidence and say, this data doesn't necessarily need to be produced by nanodiamonds. It could just be stacks of graphite or graphene. Now this is a real problem for the impact theory because the, the three major lines of evidence, which is that the magnetic grains, um, the iridium, and now the nanodiamonds have all been questioned or found to be not reproducible. Um, and that's really odd because the original data in the Firestone paper looked very compelling and comprehensive. So it's difficult to see how so much evidence can all be wrong or misinterpreted. And yet, opponents of the theory have chipped away at each line of evidence, calling the whole theory into considerable doubt. So how can either side have got it so wrong? It almost looks like a conspiracy at this stage. That there is so much contradictory evidence now that it looks like one side is either completely incompetent or is playing a deliberate game or trick. But we are none the wiser as to who is correct. The only way out of this impasse is for other researchers to get involved and see if they can reproduce the evidence or not. So then things take an even murkier turn. Remember Vance Haynes. Um, so he was the uh, eminent anthropologist who um, had worked at one of the sites involved in this controversy, uh, Murray Springs, for decades. Uh, so he's an expert at this specific site. Uh, and uh, he had previously suggested that the Younger Dryas event was practically in an instantaneous extinction level event signaled by the black mat, uh, but he doubted the comet impact theory. And remember that he had previously co-authored the paper um, with Todd Surreval as lead author, which failed to re reproduce the magnetic grain data except at one site, Lubbock Lake. Well, now in this paper, he publishes some of his own data, along with his co-authors, for magnetic grains at the base of the black mat at Murray Spring. Uh, and this is what he found. This is, his, this is the key data from this paper. What he found was a massive spike. OK, so this is the, the percentage weight of the soil sample in, of magnetics. And this is... Um, these are different samples, so this is essentially the depth through the soil at the base of the black mat. And what he found is a, mag is, a, is a massive spike in the magnetic grains at the base of the black mat. In fact, his spike in magnetic grains is three times higher than the one measured by the Comet Research Group. So he finds that nearly 1% by weight of the soil at the base of the black mat consists of magnetic grains, which is a massive amount. And moreover, these grains are, the, the measurements in the paper show that these grains are heavily enriched in iridium, just like the Comet Research Group found, which suggests that they have a cosmic origin and not a terrestrial origin. So this looks like it confirms the impact theory at this specific site. But do you know what his conclusion is? Bizarrely, he insists this is not a positive result for the impact theory. Instead, he suggests these magnetic grains are simply an accumulation of the dust that falls to Earth all the time. So in other words, he's saying it's simply a concentrated layer of the normal atmospheric dust produced by tiny meteorites that Earth interacts with all the time. So the black mat, in his view, acts like a sieve for normal, everyday magnetic grains that fall to Earth all the time. 
And moreover, he points to a, a concentration of, of magnetic grains recovered from a stream bed near where he has been digging at this site to find the, the black mat. So he finds a concentration of magnetic grains in a stream bed which are practically identical um, as the ones found at the base of the black mat. Now, in his view, therefore, the black mat acts just like this nearby stream, and it's sieved out this background level of magnetic dust that is always falling to Earth. So this argument that the, the signals at the base of the black mat are nothing unusual and simply show that the black mat filters out this dust from the atmosphere all the time uh, has been used before by others, and it's getting to be quite a common way to block the impact theory. So despite confirming the Comet Research Group's results for magnetic grains at Murray Springs, he brushes away its significance. He admits the grains are there, but is saying they're nothing unusual. Now I find his conclusion very telling. It shows quite clearly how sometimes those closest to the debate are the worst at making balanced scientific judgments. I say this because it could just as easily be the case that the magnetic gra grains found in the stream bed nearby are ancient younger dryas magnetic grains that have been eroded or washed away from the black mat and have found their way into this stream. There's basically no way we can know how these grains in the stream bed got there. Uh, but he concludes that they've probably been sieved out of the atmosphere. Now the Comet Research Group point this out in their rebuttal paper. Moreover, it should be easy to tell, actually, whether the geochemical signals at the base of the black mat are simply concentrated from the atmosphere or sieved out of the atmosphere, or whether they represent the fallout from a cosmic explosion. Because if they're simply concentrated by the black mat from the dust in the atmosphere, just the normal dust in the atmosphere, then we would expect to see a drop in the level of these geochemical markers in higher soil levels to compensate for the excess in the black mat. The problem made with the measurements by Vance Haynes in this plot here is that they're too limited. We can't see if this excess spike is cancelled out by a reduction at higher levels because he doesn't make measurements at higher levels. So this allows him to make his counter argument. However, the Comet Research Group's data, and I'll show you again, is much more extensive. They measure right through the black mat to higher levels and lower levels. And it's very clear that these represent massive excesses. So that's indicating a sudden huge input from an explosion. Uh, and as Vance Haynes in his paper, which we'll go back to, finds an even higher level, three times higher, than the Comet Research Group, um, it's clear that his data also represents a massive excess too. So his conclusions are probably wrong. Although we can't show that from his data, but we can when we look at the Comet Research Group's data. So he should really have made the opposite conclusion. It's really his belief in the existing paradigm that's prevented him from doing this. So this is poor science. So now things are starting to look a bit brighter for the Comet Research Group. It's now clear that their data is correct for Lubbock Lake and Murray Springs for the magnetic grains. And that this is very likely represents a massive excess of exotic material, probably from a cosmic explosion. At this point, we should probably judge that the, the Comet Research Group data is more or less correct. But it's hard to reproduce either because the location of the, the bottom, or the location of the layer where these geochemical signals are found is hard to find, or perhaps others have made mistakes with their analysis or with their conclusions. Nevertheless, it would be better if there was even more confirmatory data. Okay, now the next paper is also very interesting. Remember the paper that by Paquet et al. that could not reproduce the data for exotic elements like iridium. I'll just bring up their paper. Okay, so they could not reproduce um, these high concentrations of iridium that the Comet Research Group found. They found much lower concentrations, typical of um, what's found normally in um, the Earth crust. Well, what they don't show in this, in the main body of the paper, but is buried in their supporting information section, is that their data that is that actually contradicts their own conclusions. So let's just go and find this this supporting information. Now, there, the data in their supporting information is is tabulated, but um, in this uh, response paper, um, Bunch and West. Uh, and others plot their data in these uh, plots here. 
So from this, we can see that the, the spikes, and it's the black line that we should be concentrating on here, okay? Concentrations of iridium from pack A et al. We can see that there are actually spikes in their measurements of iridium precisely at the same point as the other indicators at the base of the black mat. However, it's just that these spikes are much, much smaller than the ones found by the Comet Research Group in their original paper, by about a factor of 30. Okay, so essentially they, they kind of reproduced the, the spikes in iridium at the base of the black mat. It's just that what they found was much, much smaller than the amounts found by the Comet Research Group. Now, to my mind, this suggests some kind of problem with their treatment of the samples which perhaps reduced the iridium signal that they were searching for. But we can't know this. We still really need more data from other independent researchers that either confirms or refutes the impact theory. And that's exactly what happens. So the impact theory is on a roll now. It's seemingly back from the dead. So the next paper we'll look at is by Kerbatov, Mayevsky, and uh, their co-authors, who are um, many people from the, the Comet Research Group. So Kerbatov and Majewski, uh, the independent researchers, but they're joined by the Comet Research Group on this paper. They find a rich layer of nanodiamonds in the Greenland ice sheet. So this is the, the layer with nanodiamonds that they find sandwiched between um, dusty layers of ice uh, in the Greenland ice sheet. So again, this is another shot. This is the dusty layer, and this is the nano diamond peak layer just below it. Now, according to their measurement of oxygen isotopes uh, through the ice layers with depth, uh, it seems to occur precisely, this um, layer of nano diamonds seems to occur precisely uh, where it should at the beginning of the Younger Dryas cold period, which is about here. Now, the nano diamonds are massively in excess. Here are their measurements. So with depth through the ice, this is the sample number. This is the uh, nan number of nano diamonds or the density of nano diamonds. There is a massive spike, millions of times higher than the background level. Now there is no black mat here. We have some dust, but there's no black mat like we have at St. Murray Springs. Moreover, the very rare and very exotic, exotic form of nano diamond called Lonsdaleite is also identified by these researchers from their electron scattering data. So if we believe their analysis of these electron scattering plots, uh, it's clear that a large cosmic explosion occurred over Greenland. It seems very likely to have occurred just at the onset of the Younger Dryas cold period, according to their measurements of the oxygen isotopes. So this is really strong evidence in favor of the impact theory, but we, we don't know whether this blanket of what is probably nanodiamonds in the Greenland ice is connected to the ones we found over the rest of North America by the Comet Research Group. Common, common sense suggests it probably is, but proving it is more tricky since we don't have a radiocarbon date for this layer in the Greenland ice. All we have is this oxygen isotope trace, which seems to fit very well to what is expected for the Younger Dryas cold period. And the, the nano diamond excess occurs, it seems, right at the origin, or right at the beginning of this, um, the Younger Dryas period. So at this point, there are really few places left for the opponents of the impact theory to go. It's, it's fairly clear a cosmic explosion happened. The main question now is how big it was, and are the signals found across North America from the same event as the one that seems to be uh, indicated in the Greenland ice sheet. Or perhaps were there lots of small unconnected events that happened at more or less the same time? Certainly it appears quite likely now that the failure of the Comet Research Group's opponents to reproduce the geochemical signals at the base of the black mat is probably due at best to simple mistakes in the soil analysis. But we still cannot be absolutely sure of this. So more evidence is needed to confirm this beyond any doubt. Now, you might think that the opponents of the impact theory are beginning to doubt themselves now with the strength of this evidence, but not so, apparently. They continue to publish papers opposing the impact theory as though nothing had happened. For example, uh, Scott and Pinter argue 
in this paper that the spherules found by the Comet Research Group are probably scorched fungus and not impact generated. But they had already ruled out the spherules as not being a useful indicator because we cannot decide what is spherical enough to count. So this is a moot point, even if it was true. So we can delete that paper as well. Also, um, Vance Holliday, uh, joined by uh, David Meltzer now, in their paper argue that people alive at the time, nearly 13,000 years ago, that the Clovis population in North America probably didn't notice the event, whatever it was, because their population wasn't affected. So this is their paper. The problem with their view, which they, which you can read in their abstract here, is that their conclusions are not supported by their own data. So, okay, so this is their data. So what they have here are all the campsites found uh, in North America around the Younger Dryas period, um, ordered according to their calibrated radiocarbon age. So these are the different campsites. And this black and this um, gray band indicates the time span of the Younger Dryas period. Now there is some uncertainty in the dating of the onset and the ending of the Younger Dryas. So we shouldn't take these as being absolutely well known. Now, as you can see straight away, there seems to be some kind of change or transition in these in this data at around this point. So both the density of points with time before and after is different. And in addition to that, the error bars or the uncertainty in the radiocarbon date before and after about this point, 12,800 years before present, is very different. So here the error bars are much smaller and here the error bars are much larger. And that's indicating that there's been some kind of massive disruption to the environment at around about this time, 12,800 years before uh, before present or about 12,850 uh, or about 10,850 BC. Actually their error bars should be about, should be twice as long. They've drawn the error bars here at the level of what's known as one standard deviation, they, they shouldn't normally be about twice that. Uh, so they've kind of underrepresented in this plot the uncertainty in all of these error bars. Anyway, the key point to note is that there is a change. If, if we draw a line through these, a straight line through these points up to where this apparent transition occurs, the slope of this line before that point and the slope of this line after that point they look to be very different. In fact, the slope after this apparent transition is about three or four times greater than it is before. And that indicates that the, the number of campsites and therefore probably the number of people was about three or four times less, in other words, a third or a quarter, what it was before whatever took place at, at this time. So that's indicating that there was a dramatic effect probably on the people at the time, but Holiday and Meltzer conclude the opposite. They conclude from this data that there was no dramatic effect. And the reason they make that conclusion is because they are looking for a step or a bottleneck in the population. So they're looking for, if you like, a gap in this data where there are no points. But the problem with looking for a gap is that that assumes that these radiocarbon dates are accurately known and that they have been rigorously generated. Now, if you go to the supporting evidence of this for this paper, you'll see that many of the radiocarbon dates here have not been published in peer-reviewed journals. They've not, they've not been put through a rigorous peer review process. So many of the, these radiocarbon dates are questionable in themselves. And moreover, because of the uncertainty in this range of in these dates, which is actually underrepresented by this data, it should be twice as much, uh, it's quite obvious that it'll be very difficult to find a a gap or a jump or a bottleneck in the human population. So essentially what these authors are doing, Holiday and Meltzer, is they again they are relying on the accuracy of this radiocarbon data which hasn't even been peer-reviewed more than simply counting the number of sites before and after this event. And again that's a flawed approach. It's much easier, it's much more reliable to simply count the density with time of these sites than it is 
to try and judge whether there is a, a step or a jump in the population at this time because of the uncertainty in the radiocarbon data. So they've made the wrong conclusion from their own data. They have said that there was no effect on human populations at this time. And clearly, there was quite a dramatic effect because of this change in the slope of this data. So once again, we see the filter of, of a belief system operating. Regardless of the evidence, they interpret it according to their belief in the existing paradigm, even if the data is not consistent with that. What surprises me, though, is that work like this gets through the peer review system unchecked. So again, we can delete this paper from our database because it's flawed. The rest of the papers in 2010, uh, we'll come back to later when we look at research in the following years, because those these specific papers, uh, the rest of these papers, they don't have an immediate impact on the debate this year, but we'll use them in telling the story in later years. So by the end of 2010, the Younger Dryas impact theory has had a dramatic revival. New evidence of nano diamonds in the Greenland ice sheet in particular strongly supports the theory. It seems that the Comet Research Group has been vindicated. The main question now is whether the signals found across North America resulted from the same impact as the one that seems to have occurred over Greenland, or whether they are just lots of smaller independent research um, impacts. Common sense says the former, but we, we can't be sure of that yet. And also, if their opponents have made mistakes with their soil analysis, which seems likely, what were they? Okay, so if you like that, then stay tuned for the next video, which will follow in about two weeks. And take a look at my blog, martinsweltman.blogspot.com, and my book, Prehistory Decoded.